Good afternoon. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives. For our program, Ike and McCarthy, Dwight Eisenhower's secret campaign against Joseph McCarthy with, that, with author David A. Nichols. Whether you're here in the McGowan Theater or watching us on YouTube, thank you for joining us. Before we get started, I'd like to tell you about two programs coming up soon in this theater. As part of our observance of the centennial of World War I, we'll welcome award-winning historian Elizabeth Cobbs here on Tuesday, April 25th at noon. She'll discuss and sign her latest book, The Hello Girls, America's First, America, First Women Soldiers, which tells the story of the 300 remarkable women selected by the U.S. Signal Corps to operate the vital communications network that helped win World War I. And on Wednesday, May 3rd at noon, we'll present a special program, one of several that commemorate the 100th birthday, 100th birthday of President John F. Kennedy. Historian Douglas Brinkley and JFK's nephew Stephen Kennedy Smith will be here to discuss their book, JFK, A Vision for America, which brings together Kennedy's greatest speeches alongside essays by America's top historians, political thinkers, writers, and artists, and a book signing will follow that program. To learn more about these and all of our public programs, consult our monthly calendar of events in print or online. There are copies in the lobby as well as a sign-up sheet where you can receive it by regular mail or email. The National Archives and Records Administration oversees 14 presidential libraries including the, White, the Dwight D. Eisenhower Library in Abilene, Kansas. Each library is an unmatched resource for information about the insight into a president, his family, and associates. As, as scholars burrow deeply into the records and as more material is released over time, we often see shifts in how a president and the presidency is perceived. This is certainly true of Dwight Eisenhower. While he was once regarded as a genial but de detached, as de genial but detached, he is presented as more complex and a more involved president. One major criticism of Eisenhower was that he did not confront Senator Joseph McCarthy during his anti-communist crusade. Today's guest, David Nichols, having investigated documents in the Eisenhower Library and elsewhere, reveals how Eisenhower worked behind the scenes to engineer McCarthy's downfall. In his book, Acknowledgements, Nichols, Nichols graciously thanks the staff of the Eisenhower Library, including former director Carl Weisenbach, his successor Tim Reeves, and archivist Christopher Abrams. While Dr. Nichols was working on this book, he allowed us to print an excerpt in our fall 2015 issue of Prologue as a commemoration of 100, the 125th anniversary of Eisenhower's birth. And now I'd like to turn you over to the Executive Director of the Eisenhower Memorial Commission, Brigadier General Carl Riddell. General Riddell began his work with the Eisenhower <coughs> Memorial Commission in 2001 while he was Public Service Fellow in the Center for Public Service at Gettysburg College in Pennsylvania. Before arriving in Gettysburg, he was Professor and Head of the History Department at the United States Air Force Academy, President and then CEO of the Eisenhower World Affairs Institute in Washington, D.C. Please welcome Brigadier General Carl Riddell. Welcome to, indeed, a very special occasion. And today we have a, an event which is particular in my mind, of course, given my association with as the Chief Staff Officer for the National Memorialization of General and President Eisenhower. And this is a singular occasion, not just because of the authority of our speaker today and his scholarship or the good grace of the archivist in allowing me to say a few words, but I'd like to suggest that it's part of perhaps a larger evolution of some major forces in our own history in this, uh, in this country. And that what you see today is reflective to some degree of that. There are different indications of the reappreciation of General and President Eisenhower. Most recently, you may have noted that C-SPAN's poll of presidential historians and 
experts on the presidency ranked General and President Eisenhower as fifth of all American uh, presidents. And it's not an accident that this fall, groundbreaking leading to construction will take place on the National Eisenhower Memorial. <clears throat> For me to come to this uh, podium is a special chance then to speak to what I would consider the larger significance that it does not mean that the intellectual pedigree of our speaker today isn't important, or for me to talk about his lifelong service in higher education in Kansas and as a professor, but rather I'd like to be selective in making a few comments as they relate to Eisenhower. Uh, this will be, with this National Presidential Memorial, the farthest west that America will have nationally memorialized one of its presidents. The farthest west we've gone to this point is Springfield, Illinois, with Lincoln. Now we're crossing the Mississippi. And it's to me very interesting that we have with us a bona fide Kansan today talking to us here in the National Archives about Eisenhower. And presumptuously, I'd like to hint and suggest that I don't think the three books done by our author today could have been done without the National Archives, the library system you just heard a few words about, and the first-rate, truly professionally managed and led collection that exists in Abilene, Kansas. In looking at Dave's three books, which I just mentioned, I'd like to suggest, as interesting as they are individually, it's their collective impact that is really worth, I think, a moment of reflection. That, collecting, that collective impact ended up addressing what I consider three of the more enduring but fallacious criticisms of President Eisenhower. The first was in the field of civil rights. You may be familiar with Dave's book, A Matter of Justice, published in 2007. The second was Eisenhower's exercise of authority as president in the formulation of policy and in decision making, which Dave dramatically addressed in his book, Eisenhower, 1956. And we have now the third element of enduring but fallacious criticism concerning Eisenhower's relationship with Joe McCarthy. The high excellence and the quality of Dave Nichols' fact-driven research has put these criticisms to the test, and I would say largely to rest. Dave is part of a, a select group, small select group of scholars who have fundamentally changed the appreciation of the presidency and in a way which is very positive for all of us as citizens of this great country. It is beginning to show that one of the best pieces of evidence that we have that this great American experiment works is citizen Dwight David Eisenhower, and today we're privileged to have a first-hand account from the author, which I think is extraordinarily revealing of the total complexity of the man and of his presidency. And that first-hand account is of Eisenhower's secret campaign to destroy Joe McCarthy. David. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, everybody. You're hearing me okay? All right. March 27th, 1953, Dwight Eisenhower won a big victory over Senator Joseph McCarthy. Ike's nominee for ambassador to the Soviet Union, Charles Bolin, opposed by McCarthy, fiercely opposed, was confirmed by the Senate by a vote of 74 to 13. Afterwards, Eisenhower grumbled to some aides, quote, McCarthy has the bug to run for the presidency in 1956. Ike slapped his knee and thundered, the only reason I would consider running again would be to run against him. Knowing Eisenhower, he probably punctuated that declaration with a theologically incorrect expletive. Good, some of you got that, not good. 
Flash forward to December 2nd, 1954. On that date, the United States Senate formally censured Joe McCarthy by a vote of 67 to 22. After censure, when McCarthy stood up to speak on the Senate floor, the chamber emptied. When he sat down with other senators in the Senate dining room, his colleagues would make lame excuses and leave. The bands of reporters who had hung once on every word were gone. And in late 1955, Army Counsel John G. Adams visited McCarthy at his home. They sat down and Joe poured six ounces of gin. He looked awful, Adams recalled. His hands shook. The gin trickled from the corners of his mouth when he took a sip. Adams described the man that he left at the door as, quote, the cadaverous visage of McCarthyism, standing silently in the shadows, slowly dying. Indeed, Joe McCarthy did die. On May 2nd, 1957, he was only 48 years of age. That, my friends, is a peek into a very complicated story. And if I confuse you in the next few minutes, all I can say is the book is a lot better than the speech. <laughs> get, get, get the book. In terms of mystery stories, this is a how done it, not a who done it. In a who done it, we follow the clues to find out who committed the crime. In a how done it, we know who did it, and the question is, how and why. William Ewald wrote a book a generation ago with a whodunit title, Who Killed Joe McCarthy? Ewald's final conclusion was somewhat ambiguous, particularly about Eisenhower's role. Mine is not. Dwight Eisenhower did it. Ike and trusted aides launched a clandestine operation designed to wrap a gay lover's scandal around the neck of a prestigious United States senator in the president's own party in a congressional election year. In Washington, D.C., that's about as tough as it gets. <coughs> Permit me a word about that lover's <coughs> A word about that lover's scandal. The 1950s was a horrendously homophobic period. Just the rumor not the fact that someone was gay could cost them their job. And at that time, it was widely believed that homosexual people could be blackmailed by the communists. And so even the Eisenhower administration ushered a good many people out if they had questions about there being security risks. Now, you've all heard the traditional explanations for Joe McCarthy's demise, and they all have some legitimacy. McCarthy, an alcoholic, did himself in. He was damaged by Edward R. Murrell's legendary See It Now television program. During the Army McCarthy hearings, the television unmasked McCarthy as the lying demagogue he was. And in this conventional version, the final nail in McCarthy's political coffin was the censure vote by the Senate. Those are all legitimate factors, but until now we have not known with certainty that Dwight Eisenhower conducted a secret campaign to discredit McCarthy. Historians have assumed that Ike was cowardly in his response to the senator, refusing to use the bully pulpit against him. And we so often measure presidents by their use of the bully pulpit, don't we? Eisenhower, in fact, refused to even mention Joe McCarthy's name in public, believing that giving him presidential attention would only enhance his notoriety. John Adams observed, quote, Eisenhower's indifference was deceptive. He could be in control while, while appearing to loaf. Well, who was Joe McCarthy? Just to be sure that we provide the background for you, he represents to me, what Richard Hofstadter, a great historian, called the paranoid style in American politics. That paranoia, Hofstadter said, bubbles up about once every generation. You know, every generation, the American people get scared. They get scared. They were scared about communism in the 50s. They're scared about terrorism now. And when you have that kind of fear in the atmosphere, it uh, allows demagogues to thrive. But in any event, McCarthyism, that term, is still a staple 
in our political lectionary. On February 9, 1950, Joe McCarthy delivered a speech in Wheeling, West Virginia. The senator announced that he had, quote, here in my hand, the names of 205 communists in the State Department. Joe McCarthy did not have those names, but he didn't care about that. He got great headlines. William Ewald writes that from Wheeling onward, McCarthy presided over, quote, a permanent floating press conference. Lights, cameras, microphones followed him everywhere. In 1953, due to Eisenhower's election, McCarthy acquired a new platform for his crusade. The Republicans captured a one-vote majority in the Senate, and McCarthy was appointed chair of the Government Operations Committee and its permanent investigative subcommittee. And using that subcommittee, the senator subpoenaed witnesses, conducted one senator hearings, accused witnesses of guilt by association, and labeled as obviously communist anybody who attempted to invoke constitutional protections against self-incrimination. Now, McCarthy hired Roy Cohn, that's C-O-H-N, a young legal prodigy as his subcommittee's chief counsel. And Cohn insisted that McCarthy add G. David Shine, the handsome son of a wealthy New York family, as an unpaid chief consultant. And Cohn and Shine's intimate relationship, you just have to keep this in mind, this is the key, their relationship would eventually trigger the 1954 Army McCarthy hearings. Now, Eisenhower sparred with McCarthy throughout 1953. We don't have time in the presentation, but there's a lot in the book about all that happened in 1953. The senator opposed many of Eisenhower's key appointments. He held hearings into alleged communist uh, influence in the Voice of America and frightened librarians in America's overseas libraries into taking books off the shelf, and the Eisenhower administration got accused, particularly by the Democrats, of burning books. That was a charge that really upset Eisenhower. Uh, Ike hated censorship, and on June 14, 1953, he spoke at commencement at Dartmouth College. And without mentioning McCarthy's name, as always, the president said, quote, don't join the book burners. Don't think you're going to conceal faults by concealing evidence that they ever existed. Don't be afraid to go into your library and read every book as long as that document does not offend our own ideas of decency. How will we defeat communism unless we know what it is and what it teaches? And why does it have such an appeal for men? Why are so many people swearing allegiance to it? Now, Dwight Eisenhower loathed Joe McCarthy. That's the word his brother Milton used for his feelings. And uh, still he adamantly refused to, quote, get down in the gutter with that guy. The President of the United States cannot afford to name names, Ike wrote a friend. Nothing would probably please McCarthy more than to get the publicity that would be generated by public repudiation by the President. During 1953, Eisenhower had priorities other than McCarthy anyway in his first year in office. The nation was still at war in Korea, which he ended in July. The American people were still recovering from the traumas of depression and World War II. The Cold War with the Soviet Union had created a climate of fear that was the lifeblood of, of McCarthyism. But 1954 was different. In January 1954, Joe McCarthy's prestige was at its zenith, with a Gallup poll approval rating of 50% favorable, 29% unfavorable. It was 50 to 29 favorable. But by then, Dwight Eisenhower had concluded that Joe McCarthy was more than a nuisance. He was a threat to the president's foreign policy goals, to his legislative program, and to his party's and his own electoral prospects. Let me back up a little bit. In July 1953, David Schein, remember David Schein, who came on because Roy McCone wanted him, got his, was sent his draft notice from the United States Army. And in response, Roy Cohen launched a frantic campaign trying to get Schein a special commission 
that would permit him to stay with the McCarthy subcommittee and therefore with him. And Cohn constantly harassed the Army in all kinds of ways that's detailed in the book, insisting that Shine be available for things like you know, what he euphemistically called committee business on nights and weekends at a nearby hotel. Thwarted at every turn, Cohn angrily threatened to, quote, wreck the Army. And in August 1953, at Cohn's behest, McCarthy launched hearings on communists in the United States Army. Now think about that. This is with a five-star Army general in the White House. A small wonder that Eisenhower and his friends thought that eventually they'd come after him. McCarthy's first hearing in the Army took place on August 31st, 1953. Uh, there's quite a bit of this transcript of that, of that, first, that first hearing on August 31st, 53, uh, particularly with Doris Walters Powell, who was a uh, clerical. Joe, Joe would pick on low-level people. He wouldn't pick on high-level people. He'd, he'd find somebody in the middle or the lower part of the bureaucracy. So um, Doris Walters Powell was an African-American clerical worker on maternity leave. But Joe McCarthy's first words to her were, quote, let me say this, this is Powell, we have information of Communist Party membership on your part. I still get a cold chill when I read that transcript. There's more of it in the book. However, Eisenhower was already active behind the scenes. About the same time that David Schein got his draft notice, I called Fred Seaton in Nebraska. That's S-E-A-T-O-N, Fred Seaton. Some of you will recall he eventually became the Secretary of the Interior. The Seatons, a newspaper family, came from Manhattan, just down the road from Eisenhower's Abilene. Fred's father had been a secretary to Senator Joseph Bristow, who had endorsed Ike's application to West Point. In 1937, Fred moved to Nebraska to become the publisher of the Hastings Daily Tribune. Upon the death of Nebraska's Republican senator, in December 1951, the governor appointed Seton to that seat for just a year. And in the Senate, Fred Seton developed a pretty friendly relationship with Joe McCarthy. So, in July 1953, Ike asked Fred Seton to come back to Washington and take a redesigned assistant secretary position in the Defense Department. Fred would serve as the Pentagon's liaison with Congress and the press. And among other things, he was to manage matters relating to Joe McCarthy. And Ike told uh, Secretary of Defense Charles Wilson, who was a little reluctant to take on Seton, in, in, in wonderful military terms, he said he always considered Fred Seton, quote, a reserve division ready to go into action. And that's, that's good about Fred Seton. And he's one of the heroes of this story that nobody ever writes about. McCarthy's hearings into alleged communist subversion in the Army continued for months. Eisenhower wrote in his memoirs that by January 1954, Joe McCarthy was riding high. But I would suggest to you that once McCarthy started going after communists in the Army, he had effectively signed his own political death warrant. It was just a matter of time. Then in early 1954 came the turning point. On January 21st, Ike's top aides convened in the Attorney General's office, and during that meeting, Army Counsel John Adams provided the details of McCarthy's and Cohn's repeated attempts to secure special privileges for David Schein. Chief of Staff Sherman Adams ordered John Adams to, they not related, ordered John Adams to prepare a report. And the Army Counsel sent the White House a stack of documents in mid-February, Shortly thereafter, the White House returned those documents to Fred Seaton at the Pentagon with secret orders from Eisenhower to edit them into a report for publication. Meanwhile, Joe McCarthy continued hearings on communists in the Army, and he harassed Irving Perez, a dentist drafted into the Army during the Korean War, and Perez had, had uh, uh, invoked his constitutional rights when asked when he came aboard about whether he'd ever been a communist. And uh, McCarthy, of course, responded to that by labeling him a communist. 
and he subpoenaed Perez's commanding general, Ralph W. Zwicker, that's Z-W-I-C-K-E-R, for testimony. And Ralph Zwicker was one of Ike's boys, truly a hero of the war in Europe. And on February 18th, Joe McCarthy confronted General Zwicker. Again, there's a lot of this transcript in the book. Again and again, McCarthy pressed Zwicker for details about how Irving Perez, whom he considered a communist, had gotten promoted and honorably discharged. And in the ultimate insult to this hero, this war hero, Joe McCarthy charged that Ralph Zwicker was, quote, not fit to wear the uniform of the United States Army. Eisenhower on vacation in, in California was incensed when he heard about this attack on Zwicker, but as usual, he said nothing to the press. And when Ike returned to Washington on February 24th, six days later, he did not know that Army Secretary Robert Stevens that very day had naively agreed to a secret luncheon meeting with McCarthy and the other Republicans on McCarthy's subcommittee. Stevens had gone to that meeting intending to confront McCarthy about how he treated Zwicker and insist that he make a pledge not to abuse more Army personnel. Instead, the group managed to talk to Stevens, who was really naive about all this, into signing an agreement that the newspapers quickly labeled a surrender. When, the, when Stevens arrived back at the Pentagon that afternoon, Fred Seaton bluntly told him, told the secretary, Bob, you've been had. And the next morning, the New York Times ran a devastating front page photograph of Joe McCarthy whispering in Bob Stevens' ear. The newspapers also settled on another false conclusion, that because Eisenhower had arrived back at the White House the same day as Stevens' infamous lunch with McCarthy, the president must have ordered Stevens to surrender to McCarthy. In his uh, scholars like me are so indebted to particularly diaries, those of you who do research, diaries are the most valuable thing you can have. And Eisenhower's press secretary, Jim Haggerty, kept a wonderful diary. And, and after this, he describes the president as, quote, very mad and getting fed up. That states it mildly. Dwight Eisenhower was having a full-blown presidential temper tantrum. This was, the president thundered about, quote, his army. This guy, McCarthy, is going to get in trouble over this. Ike barked. I'm not going to take this one lying down. My friends tell me it won't be long in this army stuff before McCarthy starts using my name instead of Stevens. He's ambitious. He wants to be president. He's the last guy in the world who will ever get there if I have anything to say. Eisenhower ordered Stevens to the White House, accompanied by Fred Seaton. A team led by Richard Nixon drafted a statement for Stevens to issue, retailing, repudiating the chicken lunch agreement. Ike himself edited that statement for a full 30 minutes, and Haggerty noted, quote, made it stronger. Stevens read the statement to the press, filled with the general's terse, terse military language. I shall never accede to the abuse of Army personnel under any circumstances, including committee hearings, Stevens declared. I shall never accede to them being browbeaten or humiliated. When Stevens finished that statement, Jim Haggerty rose and said, quote, I'm the president. He has seen the statement. He approves and endorses it 100%. Well, I could really written most of it, but anyway. That's typical Eisenhower. We can get into that in Q&A. From that moment forward, the war with McCarthy accelerated. Seton, other and key Pentagon people intensified their work rewriting John Adams' report on McCarthy, Cohn, and Schein. In early March 1954, the Eisenhower forces exploited two important events, both of them on March 9th. Uh, that day, Republican Senator Ralph Flanders of Vermont attacked Joe McCarthy in a speech on the floor of the United States Senate. Now, did the White House recruit Flanders to do that? We can't prove it for sure, although he had a luncheon with his very good friend Sherman Adams. They'd been neighboring governors uh, the week before. 
So I suspect he did, but we don't know. Uh, uh, and, and on the Senate floor, though, Flanders asked about Joe McCarthy. To, you know, remember, this is a Republican senator attacking another Republican senator. So, to what party does he belong, Flanders said. One must conclude, the Vermont senator went on, that his is a one-man party and that its name is McCarthyism. And Flanders concluded his speech with a sarcastic riff about McCarthy's persecution of that dentist, Irving Perez. McCarthy, Flanders boomed, dons his war paint. He goes into his war dance. He admits his war hoops. He goes forth to battle and proudly returns with the scalp of a pink army dentist. Flanders had already sent a copy of his remarks to Dwight Eisenhower, who publicly commended them. And that evening, March 9th, Edward R. Murrow eloquently condemned McCarthy on his See It Now television program, and he included quotations from the Flanders speech. I don't think there was any collaboration between Murrow and the White House, but the Murrow's program had been widely advertised, so the White House knew it was coming. Uh, Murrow included, well, I said, <laughs> Murrow derided the senator as a one-man committee who had demoralized the State Department and leveled charges of conspiracy against the Army, including declaring the General Ralph Wicker was unfit to serve. And Murrow argued that, quote, the line between investigating and persecuting is a very fine one. And the junior senator from Wisconsin has stepped over it repeatedly. Murrow closed with devastating eloquence. We will not walk in fear, one of another. We will not be driven by fear into an age of unreason. It is no time, Murrow concluded, for people who oppose Senator McCarthy's methods to keep silent. We cannot, he declared, defend freedom abroad by deserting it at home. Those are words for the ages, I think, of any era. Two days later, on March 11th, Fred Seaton released the 34-page Shine Report on behalf of the Army. Now, not the White House, the Army. Eisenhower, even in his memoirs, never acknowledged his role. He wrote that the Army, not the White House, moved over to the attack. I did not mention Fred Seaton, who was actually operating under his orders. Jim Haggerty called that report a pip, showing constant pressure by Cohn to get Shine a soft army job with Joe in and out of the threats. Haggerty believed that report would bust things wide open, and it did. The result was a firestorm of controversy leading to the televised Army McCarthy hearings that lasted for two months. I don't know whether there's anyone here, in here besides me old enough to remember how many networks we had in those days. Yeah, yeah. Three, three main networks. It wasn't like your TV now, you know. Three main networks. And this was on for hours a day, and millions of Americans watched it day after day. And, and uh, uh, I can only share two episodes this, 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 this noon with you, but there's more in the book. Uh, in May, the hearings erupted into demands for, by both parties, by, both, by senators from both parties, for testimony about that January 21st meeting. You remember, that's where they first learned about all the details about this relationship. That January 21st meeting at which the Eisenhower forces had first examined that mccarthy cohn shine relationship. Ike refused to allow his personal, personal advisors to be subpoenaed and thereby also unmask his own involvement. So on May 17th, Eisenhower invoked executive privilege, citing historic precedent for the protection of presidential advisors. In response, Joe McCarthy did something extraordinary. He challenged government employees to disobey their superiors and report directly to him, saying, their oath to protect and defend this country against all enemies, foreign and domestic, is a commitment that towers far above any presidential secrecy directive. 
Eisenhower shot down McCarthy's tirade with a statement issued under the Attorney General's name. But then I called Jim Haggerty as press secretary into the Oval Office and vented his rage at, quote, the complete arrogance of McCarthy. Pacing behind his desk, Eisenhower thundered that McCarthy's challenge to federal employees to disobey their superiors, quote, amounts to nothing but wholesale subversion of public service. McCarthy, he thundered, is making exactly the same plea of loyalty to him that Hitler made to the German people. Both tried to set up personal loyalty within the government, while both were using the pretense of fighting communism. McCarthy is trying to deliberately to subvert the people we have in government, people who are sworn to obey the law, the Constitution, and their superior officers. I think this is the most disloyal act we have ever had by anyone in the government of the United States. Knowing I, he probably decorated that with some more theologically uh, incorrect uh, language. They always edited all, all that out in the transcripts, but those of us who knew him well knew that he did. Our Army Attorney Joe, Joe Welch's famous confrontation with McCarthy took place on June 9th, 1954, and those of you who know something about that wouldn't forgive me if I left that one out. McCarthy charged that Welch had in his law firm a young man named Fred Fisher who had been associated once with an allegedly pro-communist organization. A hush fell over the room when McCarthy hurled that accusation at Welch. Welch sat with his head in his hands, staring at the table. Then he addressed the hearing chairman, Carl Munt. Mr. Chairman, under these circumstances, I must have something approaching a personal privilege. But McCarthy was pacing about, ordering aides to retrieve the file on Fred Fisher. Welch repeatedly tried to get McCarthy's attention without success. Finally, he declared, until this moment, Senator, I think I have never really gauged your cruelty or your recklessness. Fred Fisher is starting what appears to be a brilliant career with us. Little did I dream, Welch continued, you would be so reckless and cruel as to do an injury to that lad. I fear he shall always bear a scar needlessly and inflicted by you. I like to think that I'm a gentleman but your forgiveness will have to come from someone other than me. But McCarthy continued to pace about attacking Fisher, and finally Welch interrupted in a commanding voice, let us not assassinate this lad further, Senator. You have done enough. Have you no sense of decency, sir? At long last, have you left no sense of decency? I might add that during all this, the, um, the Republicans tried about five times to shut down the hearings. They knew they were doing damage to the Republican Party and above all to McCarthy and made numerous efforts that are outlined in the book. The fifth one was carried by Sec Army Secretary Robert Stevens to Ike himself. McCarthy had asked Stevens to do it. And, and so he wanted to end the, you know, propose to end the hearings for the good of the country. And Ike slapped his desk and declared, no, we've got the bastard right where we want him. By the time the hearings ended, Joe McCarthy was upside down in the polls. His approval rating had gone down to 34%. In July 1954, Roy Cohn resigned to return to New York to his law practice and eventually became the lead attorney and mentor for 13 years to one Donald Trump. That's another story, that's not in my book. <laughs> uh, on December 2nd, 1954, McCarthy's senatorial colleagues censured him, as you know, by a vote of 67 to 22. Two days after that, Eisenhower invited Senator Arthur Watkins of Utah, the chair of the censure committee, to the White House, and afterward, the president issued a statement commending Watkins for, quote, a very splendid job of managing the censure process. That was more than Joe McCarthy could take. And on December 7th, 1954, he walked into the first hearing of his subcommittee in months 
and apologize to the American people for ever supporting Dwight Eisenhower for president. But the struggle was over. In a June 1955 meeting with legislative leaders, Eisenhower repeated a joke that was now making the rounds in Washington. It's no longer McCarthyism, the president said. It's McCarthy wasm. <laughs> Eisenhower emerged publicly from his silence on McCarthy in an article written for the Reader's Digest just prior to his death. I edited out the sharpest comment, criticisms of McCarthy in early versions, but still he could not resist writing, quote, what a lot of people today don't know is that behind the scenes, I was doing all I could to assist those who were wrongly accused. And in many cases, my efforts were effective. Eisenhower recalled in that article that once the struggle with McCarthy was over, a former aide and critic of his approach to McCarthy came and said to him, by gosh, Mr. President, you were right about McCarthy. And a smiling Eisenhower responded, sometimes I am. <laughs> Dwight Eisenhower died on March 28, 1969. His article, We Must Avoid the Perils of Extremism, was published the following month. And for all his editing, Dwight Eisenhower had finally publicly denounced Joe McCarthy. Thank you. I welcome your questions. See, who's my timekeeper? So somebody, I'll, I'll need to have somebody give me a signal when to quit. Okay. I have okay. a questions. Yeah, I, I have a. Pardon? I have a multi-part question. I hope I, I think I get quickly and. Yes. Uh, whatever happened to Doris Watkins Powell? She was suspended. Was it ever rescinded? And did she get her back pay? No, she lost her job. She I don't lost know whether it. she got any back pay or not, but she eventually uh, was dismissed. And you mentioned the picture uh, with Shine in front of the airplane. In front of the airplane, on, it was on page ninety-four. Mm -hmm. Is that extant? You, you read the book. Yeah. I'm <laughs> <laughs> is that ex is that picture extant? Does it exist? Um, I do not know, sir. I'm okay. Sorry. And the, the the thing that gets me was the fractious news conference uh, chapter. The was there a rift between Eisenhower and? Uh, Brownell over how that was handled, whether he was in, Eisenhower was informed about Harry Dexter White. Oh yeah, that's that's it's the story about how he, you know Herbert Brownell in November. Of, not, I didn't get into this at all in the presentation, but in, in November of 1953, um, Herbert Brownell had unearthed a number of documents that indicated he thought that the Truman administration really mishandled the 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 treasonous or spying activities of Harry Dexter White who had been in the uh, Treasury Department. And, and uh, so Brownell made a speech about that, and it's one of the moments that doesn't go well for Eisenhower and Brownell. Uh, Richard Nixon, who was one of their main political advisors, was in the Far East, and so they didn't get good political advice. It was not, it was one of those things that went sideways on them. And uh, eventually, uh, let's see, let's go back though. You're talking about the the where Eisenhower said in the press conference he hadn't been briefed and Brownell, uh, Brownell said yeah, that he had right, been right yeah, yeah. and uh, Eisenhower yeah Brownell said that to himself he didn't say it publicly I know yeah and then later on in the cabinet <laughs> meeting defends Eisenhower one of the things you have to know about and you may not like it but what Eisenhower was a master at delegating to people key competence like Her Herbert Brownell. And they not only understood they were to do what he wanted them to do, but if the thing went south, they would take the heat. And that's what Eisenhower did to Herb Brownell in that situation publicly. In effect, you could say lied, certainly misled the press about knowing about it. He just did, somehow didn't know anything. When, when Brownell said, in fact, he had read the speech aloud yeah. to Eisenhower. And, uh, you know, I, I can't... Uh, that, Eisenhower's penchant for secrecy, secrecy protecting his own popularity it was well known in Herbert Brownell's uh, uh, memoir. He talks about that, that Ike would sometimes leave him out on the proverbial limb, and they were expected to hang there. 
And he oh, wow. did, and later on went to the cabinet meeting and, and defended what the president had done. Herb Brownell was, in my estimation, a remarkable guy. And the last part is, what was the magic of Joe McCarthy? When you read the book, you can see he was a bully, he was a loud, a loud mouth. What was the magic that made people quake underneath him when they got in front of him? Oh, yeah, such a good question. Thank you. Uh, I don't know. You know. One of the problems we have in talking about Joe McCarthy is his senatorial papers are still not available for research. They are locked up for as long as his daughter lives. And I'm not sure what happens after she dies. That uh, a scholar like me, I would have been up to Marquette University in Milwaukee in a heartbeat to work in those, but I was com repeatedly told that we could not get into those papers. So McCarthy's side of it isn't very well, but, but having said, McCarthy was brilliant in his own way. He had a great flair for getting headlines, and that's what he was after, and he didn't mind telling a big lie, and the bigger lie, uh, uh, the, the more headlines he got, and folks, I would suggest to you that's not new in American history, uh, and it still maybe is around. I've heard rumors, okay? Uh, I, I don't know if that's answered you. Yeah, but Joe, Joe's great motivation was headlines. You know, there, look, we, in fairness to Joe McCarthy, we, we need to say there were spies in the United States government. This was in the midst of the Cold War. There were spies, and that's been well documented. There's no evidence that Joe McCarthy ever caught one, however. Some questions on the other side. What yes. about what about uh, McCarthy's attempt to purge other senators through the political system? Did Eisenhower get involved in the in the party uh, um, election sort of things, the primaries and so forth, particularly in Wisconsin? Yeah, most of that was prior to Eisenhower taking office, and I don't pretend to be expert on the that. that pur sir. Purge of Alexander Wiley. Yeah, that Wasn't was that later, 1950-51. Yeah. Did you? Yeah, and I do. I I have not done detailed research on that, but yeah, it was a scurrilous kind of thing he did with Wiley, certainly. And and uh, I'm sorry I can't give you a lot of detail on that because I really start with Eisenhower in '53, and that was still bubbling around, but it wasn't front and center during the '53-'54 period. Yes, sir. I, I want to. Go back to your comment about there were spies and things that McCarthy got right that he didn't know or have anything connected to. Is there anybody doing research or have you had come across anything? What did the Soviet Union think of McCarthyism at the time, that period? How were they reviewing that or analyzing that? Or is there anything that was no, public? I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have, I tell people I know a whole lot about a little. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, 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 I don't have information on that. We have to. I have to say, however, that the Eisenhower administration did go after spies and security risks. Eisenhower enunciated that employment in the government was a privilege, not a right. And so they had about four categories of people that they would consider security risks, including alcoholics, blabbermouths, homosexuals, and, uh, and uh, philanderers. I think those are the four. But I haven't answered your question worth a hoot. I'm sorry. Okay. Hi. First of all, I'd like to thank you for coming here today and share a lot about that little you know about McCarthy, period, and Eisenhower. Um, you also pointed out, uh, you know, that we live in a times history somewhat repeats itself in terms of the communist fear. Now we have the fear of terrorism. Uh, to kind of use, I guess, to, <clears throat> to borrow from our current president, there's no question that McCarthy was a bad hombre. Okay. Uh, now there's some question on who the bad hombre may be, but we seem to be in a period similar to this, certainly fake news, this type of thing. So as historians, I think one of the great things that historians do, they write about what they know in a period before so we can use them now as we live. Are there lessons from your book or that whole period that can apply now um, in terms of making our world, our country, whatever our aims are, are better? Because in some ways it's reversed. Eisenhower's the hero in this book and it's somebody else. Somebody might argue that it's gonna have to be an outsider this time. Yeah, that's dangerous territory for a historian. <laughs> that's, why I put, that's why I put you there. Yeah, I, I know, I know. Well, I'll try not to dodge your question uh, because uh, I think, as Richard Hofstetter, I mentioned it, Richard Hofstetter, this paranoid style bubbles up every generation. And one of the 
characteristics of democracy is that people can tell big lies and get coverage for it. Sure. And you could argue that Joe McCarthy was, was a, a, a producer of fake news. Mm -hmm. That's what that 205 communists in the state were, was of fake news. And he got coverage then, and of course our media is even more intensive now. They just follow every word that the president said or anybody else says. And so I think we've had that kind of thing again. And it, there are, you know, I have not written about it in depth, but there have been articles out about what Roy Cohn taught Donald Trump. That's it. That was interesting. And, and taught him, you know, when, when, when Roy Cohn, when Trump first consulted with Roy Cohn, are you with me? Roy Cohn was the chief counsel mm -hmm. to McCarthy. You know, he was only 25 years old when McCarthy hired him. And so he went back to New York and had law practice and became known as the, perhaps the most ruthless attorney in New York. And uh, when, when Trump and his father first came to him, the United States government was suing them for discrimination in their housing. This is 1973, as I recall. And that uh, Trump went to, to Roy Cohn and asked his advice. And Cohn said, tell him to go to hell and take him to court. That's what they did, and they eventually settled. Uh, he taught him never to apologize, uh, to attack your enemies vociferously, and uh, if you tell a big lie, uh, tell a big one, you know, tell a big one and stick to it, never back off, never apologize. Now, I don't mean to offend anybody with that, it's just my observation that it's similar, but as I say to you, historians going into that ground are probably uh, walking on, on uh, thin ice. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. I had heard that uh, Bobby Kennedy had uh, worked for um, uh, uh, Roy Cohn and also for uh, his boss. Uh, was that true? Yes, that's true. The McCarthy, McCarthy uh, and the Kennedys were quite thick and quite, uh, quite close. And uh, I know a scholar who's working on quite a bit of that now. Uh, I have not worked on it in depth, but Robert Kennedy was attached to McCarthy and to Cohn for a while, and then left, I think about, I think he left in, in 1954 to do other things. But, but initially, they were uh, very close, the Joe Kennedy family and McCarthy was very close. And uh, gee, I understand uh, Bobby Kennedy went to, to McCarthy's, I, don't, I can't validate this for sure, went to McCarthy's funeral, but uh, sat someplace where nobody would see him or know he was there. So, yeah, they were close. They, 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 that's, that's true. I do not know, sir, in lots of detail about that. Was Bobby Kennedy involved in the anti-communist witch hunt? I think you could say, you know, as a, as a young attorney, he was working on it. I, you know, I can't cite, uh, my goodness, I was on a Robert Kennedy delegation <laughs> back in 1968. Uh, I, 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 I don't know, I can't document that he did the kind of public uh, statements that McCarthy did. Uh, he was much more prudent than that. So, but again, you're in territory that I don't pretend to be knowledgeable about. Thank you, yes sir. I have not yet read the book. Um, but I recall that one of the criticisms of President Eisenhower during the McCarthy period was that he did not stand up for General Marshall when McCarthy attacked Marshall. That's right. Can you, can you explain a little about that? Yes, uh, the prologue to the book deals with that episode. That Eisenhower gave a speech on October 3rd, 1952 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and Joe McCarthy was gonna be on stage. Wisconsin, and Eisenhower had consciously planned to include, you know, uh, let me back this up for a minute. McCarthy had, in effect, accused George Marshall, this great man, of treason in one way or another. He made a big speech, particularly in 1951, accusing him of all kinds of things, of losing China, of losing Eastern Europe. And, and, and Eisenhower had, in fact, on August 22nd, 52, strongly defended Marshall in a news conference. But he was going to insert these 74 words in the speech that night of October 3rd to, in effect, stick a rhetorical thumb in Joe McCarthy's eye while he was on stage. But 
the Wisconsin politicians surrounded Ike on the train that day on their way to Milwaukee, Governor Kohler in particular, and Sherman Adams, Ike's chief of staff, sided with Kohler. And, and they, they were worried they were gonna lose the electoral vote in Wisconsin if he did something like this. And Eisenhower was naive as a politician. And so finally he, they talked him into it. He was angry, but he said, okay, take it out. The trouble was that the New York Times had already gotten a hint from Fred Seaton that those words of praise would be in the speech. And when they did not show up, they investigated. And of course, Joe McCarthy said he had talked Ike in taking the words out, which was not true. But it was not Ike's best moment. And, and there's no question that uh, I think the criticisms of him were legitimate. Eventually he did, as you, if you read later in the book, did in 1954 say quite a bit about Marshall in, in, a, in a speech. But uh, uh, that's not one of Eisenhower's best moments. He was no saint. And if, if you get the feeling from me, I think he's a saint, you don't really understand. The real human being, but one with remarkable abilities. And I might say one other thing about why he didn't speak out against McCarthy is he believed, not only would he, did he believe that not mentioning McCarthy's name would drive him up the wall, but he also believed that if he took him on directly, it would make him the issue, not McCarthy, and let McCarthy off the hook. Thank you. We have time for one last question. I was wondering about the role of the FBI in uh, creating, uh, in, in, in providing the associations that McCarthy used, and uh, and his, <coughs> the FBI's relationship with, uh, with with Eisenhower. Well, I was interested in that, and it may be a shortcoming in my book that we don't have more about J. Edgar Hoover and was involved in it. Hoover and McCarthy did not get along, and there's an incident, particularly in the Army McCarthy hearings where McCarthy comes out with a letter he alleges from, Joe, from J. Edgar Hoover that turned out to be uh, a part, part of the a memorandum that Hoover had written that uh, becomes known in the literature as the purloined letter because it was illegal for, for McCarthy to have it. Uh, Eisenhower, this is one thing that's a little obscure for me, Eisenhower and, and uh, Herbert Brownell both actually got along quite well with J. Edgar Hoover. We have lots of news about Hoover since, and we now believe he had a blackmail file on everybody. Whether he had one on Eisenhower, I don't know. But, but uh, he cooperated well with him, and in, in, in the terms of the two years I particularly focused on, I didn't find much evidence that he certainly collaborated or furnished McCar uh, McCarthy with material. As far as I know, he did not, but uh, I don't claim to know everything. It could still be out there. Okay, sir. We're out of time. Um, thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> Mr. Nichols will be signing copies of his book uh, about one level up outside the, uh, or two levels yeah. up outside the museum. The book store. is better than the speech, folks. Okay. <laughs>